Let me throw out a question that you know, any of you can feel free to answer. Is learning itself an art? Uh, the, the usual model is that the child is a passive vessel in which you pour the knowledge. Uh, is learning something that you have to know how to do? Like you have to learn how to learn before you can even start. You know, the museum, the, the, uh, the game program and, and your methodology really teaches us and we learn it that there is a different way of learning where you you are the master of the speed how fast you learn you go forwards and backwards it's your choice so people who come to museums they give random a chance they run around they discover their talents so learning is not working in the future I think with a teacher outside and a lot of kids sitting there and just watching at this teacher. I think we want to be part of this learning process and we want to really organize it ourselves. And I think in all our, of our three cases that's happening nowadays. Well, yeah, that, that's, I mean, that's the power of a video game. In a video game, the player is the star of that universe. It revolves around you. They're designed that way. And remember, human beings, as a sea species, we survived because we learned to learn. We are the learning species. We are programmed from birth to learn in an environment where it's important to learn. And you get immediately feedback. And you get immediate right, feedback. You know. Just as with cells, in video game learning, it reverses everything. What does the teacher say? Go home tonight, your homework is to acquire the Sword of Doom. We build that game, so acquiring the Sword of Doom requires solving some math problems. The child probably won't solve the problems that night. So they go back in, the teacher says, go and look at Khan Academy and you'll find on video 35 exactly what you need to go back in tomorrow night and capture the Sword of Doom. The child now is motivated in a right environment and they've got all the resources available, teacher, textbooks, videos, brings it all together. I think a lot of people who have made the greatest contributions in computer science didn't make it because of what they learned sitting in classrooms. It's what they did at home, playing and putting things together. They dropped out. Many yeah. of them dropped out of school. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, to your point about this learning to learn, and is there, I, I, you know, I, I have a 15-month-old son and he is a natural learner, just like what these guys are talking about, that he, that's all he wants to do. In fact, if you take him away from exploring and playing with something and, and seeing and understanding, that, that's what upsets him. And I think the problem isn't that we need to teach people how to learn. I think a lot of our current institutions actually go in the opposite direction of our natural learning instincts. They force, they, even though you want to be active and engaged and, uh, and, and, and explore things, they're treating you like a, a vessel that needs information right. to be poured in. And yeah. in here... Go ahead. You know, in, in 1980s, that's now 30 years ago, I learned Latin at a school. And I was not really good at Latin. Mm -hmm. So I bought one of the first laptops. I <laughs> put all the vocabulary of this book into this little computer. And the computer was asking me the word. I typed it in. And when I typed it correctly in it, he, he erased it. If I made an error, he recorded it. And then he asked me the wrong ones again. Yeah. And it, you know, I, I basically learned how to program basic at those days. Yeah. You know, and my Latin didn't really improve. But so, so instant <laughs> feedback is really important. You don't pour knowledge into the vessel all year, and at the end of the year, you give a one-time <laughs> test to see what they learn. Yeah. And then move on if you, they yeah. didn't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, there are a lot of good methods to improve education, but you know, for example, here in the state of California, education is a huge bureaucracy, and bureaucracies are highly resistant to change. Is there any way that some of the ideas we're talking about could actually find its way into this big, massive, inertial system. Well, one thing I'm seeing just from letters from Khan Academy users, and I'm, you know, I'm getting a couple of hundred every day now, is that some students are using Khan Academy as their primary instruction, and they're just showing up at their university or their high school just to kind of show what they've learned. And so I, I, I think it's hard to change the system. You know, it's, it's a big beast, and you've got to kind of massage it slowly, but I think over time when people find these alternate sources for learning their information and professors start to say, wait, gee, people are just showing up. I'm just a test administrator. I'm not actually, they're, they're learning someplace else. Hopefully the system itself will say, gee, maybe we need to reflect. You know, I, I don't understand why there are 300 person lecture rooms anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, on-demand video is better in every single way. A 300 person lecture room is a complete broadcast, completely passive. On-demand video, you can pause, repeat, watch at your own time. But, but the inertia, the bureaucracy is continuing to do I mean, even a 20-person classroom, you have to question, but 300-person, I can't, you know, I've challenged everyone. No one can think of why this exists, but at every university, you pay 
30,000 a year, they stick you in these rooms and you get a broadcast lecture. Well, I think we're in the middle of that really yeah. social change already. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's happening, you know. You prove it. Yeah, it's yeah. Hot, <laughs> it's <laughs> happening <laughs> on the edges. But, but it can happen yeah. on the edges because one guy in a converted closet can reach 16 million people. Yeah. I mean, the technology allows yeah. small groups of people to make big change. Well, the Internet is really the backbone of the change because that is what enables the instant communication from anywhere to anyone at almost no cost. Yeah. And we're always looking for new ways to apply this, and we're probably at the very beginning of figuring out, you know, how to really apply it. Yeah. So now, what, what's your economic model for this? So you give the product away for nothing. Yeah. Uh, it's a mysterious. And yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I used to work in the hedge fund world. I was an analyst, and, and I was doing all of this part-time, starting for my cousins, really, and it started to take off. And in September, I just felt, and it's all for an, a not-for-profit basis. Khan Academy is a 501c3 uh, organization, and we could talk about why I decided to do that. It, there was some temptation to go on a People on a can donate without... Uh, yeah, yeah, they can donate, but then I, I'm limited to it. Right. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was initially uh, essentially self-funded, and uh, there's some donations coming from the viewers, just spontaneous donations, and there's a little bit of advertising that's going to ConAcademy.org. I wasn't taking a salary until I'm, very I'm, recently. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut you oh, off yeah. because I just got the signal that we're just about totally out of time. Oh, okay. So we're going to have to wrap the show. I'd like to thank my three very distinguished guests, Peter Fries, Keith Devlin, Salman Khan. Thanks to all of you for being here and advancing public knowledge on how to improve math training so we can continue to maintain this huge technological society we've created. Thank you for watching. Be sure to tune in next time. I'm Marty Wasserman. See you next time.